All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start up here. It's about four minutes till. This is Dr. DMV's troubleshooting toolkit. And if you don't know, this is a double session and there's gonna be a break between the two sessions. So if you need to leave, you know, that's fine. And I'm Glenn Berry, I'm a principal consultant for SQLSkills.com. And please silence your cell phones if you don't wanna be embarrassed with it going off in the middle. And then here's all the good stuff that PASS does, you know, SQL Saturdays, virtual events, all this other stuff is good. And here's my yay me slide. The important part of this is my Twitter handle. How many people are on Twitter? Maybe half? Okay, well, for the rest of you, Twitter is a really good resource for SQL Server because you get to know people in the community and they get to know you. And there's a SQL help hashtag. And if you have a technical question that you can't answer on Google, you can go and post it on Twitter on SQL help and sometimes you'll get an answer in seconds because there's a lot of people who monitor that and it's almost like a race. Who can answer the question the fastest? <laughs> so it's really useful for that and also many times People have lost their job or they're looking for another job and if they know people in the community, Twitter is a very good resource. So that's my plug for, my plug for Twitter. And Glenn Allen Berry is my uh, Twitter handle. And then here's my brewing cart again, because we, in case you didn't see that. And then that's some beers that I've made. And then that was my medals a few months ago. I've got a few more since then. But anyways, what we're gonna talk about today are my SQL Server diagnostic queries. And how many people have ever used those? A lot of you, okay, good. And so we're gonna talk about that and how they came about and we're gonna go through all of them. And we've got two and a half hours to do it so I don't have to go flying through it like I usually do in a you know, one hour or 90 minute session. So we're gonna talk about how they're structured and kind of their history, how they came about. And I'm gonna go through and show them to you. And then the important thing, because anybody can run them, but the important thing is how do you interpret the results and what do they mean? What should you do or not do based on what you see when you run these queries? So anybody who's been a DBA for any amount of time knows that if something's wrong with your database, people tend to notice pretty quickly, right? And what does DBA actually mean? It's default blame acceptor. <laughs> and I got tired when I was a production DBA, I got so tired if the website or the application was slowing down, the database was always guilty until proven innocent. How many times did people come up to you and say, what's wrong with the database? They always assume that's the problem. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And I wanted a way to find out quickly because I got tired of hearing that. And that's the truth, literally, why I came up with these. So, DMV queries were added in SQL Server 2005, and then each new version of SQL Servers added new DMV queries or new columns to existing ones. And not every single one of the queries in this set is actually a DMV query. Some of them are doing things like reading the error log, for example, but most of them are DMV queries. So anyways, this gives you a lot of really useful information about your instance and your hardware and your storage, and then also a lot of stuff about your databases and how they're performing. So it's extremely useful. Keep in mind that DMV queries are not persistent, so if you restart SQL Server, all the stuff they're collecting gets cleared out. And Query Store, for example, doesn't have that problem. But there's things we can find out from here that you can't not find out, or you can't find out with Query Store. So anyways, how these are set up, is you start off with instance level queries where it doesn't matter what database you're connected to. You're collecting information about the instance or the hardware. And then there's some database level queries and it's really important and people do this all the time unfortunately, make sure you're connected to the database you care about, not master. Because I've had lots of people run these and they get all the database information about master which is usually not very interesting, okay? So don't make that mistake. And then the other thing you'll notice is that I have lots and lots of links to KB articles and blog posts and things like that inside of these. And I put them in there for myself because I use these almost daily as a consultant. So I try to make it useful and have lots of good information in there instead of just a bunch of queries. All right, so these first came out way back in 2009 and I update them every month 
And lately, all I've been really doing is just putting more documentation into them. But now that 2019 is actually released, I'll probably be adding some more stuff to that. And there's separate scripts for each version of SQL Server. So make sure you grab the right version for what you're working with. I get lots of emails, oh, this query doesn't work. And a lot of times it's because they're using the wrong version of the script for the version of SQL Server they're using. And then the other thing, I've got a special one for Azure SQL Database and another one for SQL Managed Instance. So if you're using either one of those two, I've got special query sets for those. All right, so that's enough of the PowerPoint. Now we're actually gonna go and start looking at the queries. So in case you've never seen these before, the way it looks in here is that I have a bunch of stuff at the top. And then how many people have heard of DBA tools? Okay, that's a great solution that if you don't wanna run these one by one and take you know, half an hour or more to do it, you can just use that to do it in an automated fashion and collect the results. But I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna run them one by one and talk about them. But that's, you know, I wanna plug that. So then how this is set up, first of all, I've got a query that's gonna to try to make sure you're on the right version of SQL Server if you run this one right here. And of course, I know I'm on the right version, so I'm not gonna do that. But then what you'll notice, the way these are set up, is that each one of them has a kind of a short description of what it is, and then a query number, and then a query name, and then the query, and then six dashes. And you might be wondering, why is he doing all that? Well, there's lots of people around the world who have written stuff to parse and run these queries, and they depend on this stuff to make it easier for them to parse it. So that's why it's set up that way. And Anyways, you just go and highlight the first query and run it. And obviously, you know, this tells you some pretty basic information that's actually kind of useful. So it tells me the name of my server, and if it was a named instance, that would show up there. And then it tells me what version and edition and what build of SQL Server that I'm on. And that's really important to understand because it makes a big difference. Are you on enterprise edition or standard edition? Are you on evaluation edition? Are you on developer edition? But mainly between enterprise and standard. I wanna know that. And I wanna know, you know, am I on SQL Server 2019? Or am I on a certain CU? So I'm gonna know all that just from running this. And the other thing that'll tell me is, in this case, I'm on developer edition. And then it also tells me what OS I'm on. So Windows 10 Pro. I wanna know that, because that can make a difference for a lot of different things. So now I know that. And just stepping back for a second, one of the reasons you might be even running these queries is you just started off at a new company, and there's a bunch of SQL Server instances that you don't know who installed them and who configured them and what kind of shape they're in, so you're running these on all these strange servers. You know, another scenario is you're a consultant like I am, and you're looking at a customer system and collecting all this information about it. So that's sort of the context for why, you, why would you even want to do this. All right, so then down below, I maintain a build list. And then I usually have links. I haven't done it for this yet, but there'll be links to every CU. So you can go and get the KB for that CU right from my links here. And then I have a whole bunch of links below to talk about things like, I just added this a few days ago. There's actually a KB that shows the build numbers or the versions for SQL Server 2019, because you don't know this maybe, but there's actually a patch for 2019 already. And that's, that's a good thing. They, I, they found a problem with big, big data clusters that they patched already. So there's actually a separate build that you can download like a mini CU that fixes that issue. So if you follow this link, it'll take you there. All right, so that's the first one. The second one is what I call core counts. And this is a, a message that SQL Server writes in the error log every time you start up SQL Server. So if you're one of those shops that recycles your error log frequently, when you run this query, it'll come back empty because it only writes it when you start up, not when you recycle the log. So keep that in mind. But assuming that that's not the issue, you can go in and see what is going on with your licensing. And this is really important if you're on SQL Server Standard Edition because SQL Server Standard Edition has socket limits and core limits that can bite you, especially on VMs. This happens a lot. So you're restricted to 
the lesser of four sockets or 24 physical cores, whichever is lower. So if you have somebody set up a VM and it's got eight sockets, even if it's only, say, 16 cores, it only isn't going to use the first four sockets that it finds. And it won't use the other ones. Even though the OS sees them, SQL Server won't see them. And so you'll see that here. So what you're seeing here is I have one socket with four cores and then eight logical processors since hyperthreading is enabled on my laptop. And then it says over here that it's using all eight of them. And that's what you want to see. But if you run this, and it says, hey, wait a minute. And the, and the first part of this, the OS sees, say, 48 logical processors. And then SQL Server is only using 24, for example. Then you know that you have a problem because of what happened when you installed SQL Server Standard Edition. So the, I, I see this all the time on customer systems where they throw a Standard Edition on a great big box that's above the license limits. And then SQL Server only uses a small portion of it. And this is how you spot that, OK? All right, the next one. Yeah. Yeah, this is a text string that you're picking up from the SQL Server error log. So you're saying you're looking at it somewhere a different way? Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. That's different, though. What you're talking about is what the hardware actually is. And, and I'll show that in a subsequent query. But this is different, because that other one you're talking about shows what the OS can see. And, and SQL Server, because of the license limit, might decide, I'm not going to use all those cores. That's the point, in case that's not clear. And this is only a problem with standard edition. Enterprise edition will use everything that the OS can see. But standard edition won't. You know, when Microsoft was crowing a lot about, oh, yeah, we just put new things into standard edition, like transparent database encryption, and that's great. But they did not raise the license limit at all in 2019. So the memory is still 128 gigabytes, and it's still four sockets or 24 cores, which is ever is lower. And I'm getting ready in about a month to buy and build a new AMD Threadripper system that's going to have 24 cores on my desktop plus hyperthreading. So I'm going to be able to be against that license limit on my desktop workstation. But I'm kind of crazy that way. <laughs> but seriously, I think it's too low. But they decided not to raise it for 2019. So anyways, moving on, the next query in the set is going to show me just a bunch of server property calls. So you can see things like your machine name and your server name. And if it's a named instance, it would show up here. If it was a failover cluster instance, it would show here. Also shows you, again, the addition and build. But what's kind of useful about this that you don't get from anywhere else easily is your default instance data path and your default log path right there. See that? And that's something you should get in the habit of changing when you install SQL Server. And of course, you can change it later. But it's really important that these paths actually exist because you may have been bitten by this. I know I have. If somebody goes in and changes this to something different that doesn't actually exist, and then you try to install a service pack, which aren't going to be around anymore after 2017, or a cumulative update, what will happen is the setup will get to like 99.9% .9 done, and then it will fail because this path doesn't exist. So make sure that nobody ever does that, that whatever path is set here actually exists in your file system, or else it'll, you'll be unhappy if you ever try to patch SQL Server. So that's something I always take a look at there. All right, the next one is basically doing the equivalent of SP configure. It's showing you all your instance level configuration options here. And depending on what version of SQL Server you're dealing with, you might have anywhere from the mid-60s through we have 83 rows in SQL Server 2019. And these are all in alphabetical order. And most of them, you don't need to look at that often, to be honest. But there's some new ones here for 2019, like ADR cleaner retry timeout, ADR preallocation factor. So that's for accelerated database recovery. Those are new ones. But the ones that I look at, you know, historically, I always want to know, is backup checksum default enabled? I think it should be in almost every instance. 
Backup compression default, I think that should be enabled most of the time. I want to know what's going on. Is the CLR enabled or not? I want to know what's happening with cost threshold for parallelism. The default value for that is five, and quite often that's too low. But you shouldn't just raise it to 50 or something. There's actually queries you can run on your workload to find out what a good value might be. But a lot of times, five is going to be too low. Another thing I want to know whenever I look at a strange instance is what is max degree of parallelism set to? And you might not know this, but SQL Server 2019, as part of the setup program, will set this to a recommended value for you. In older versions, it wouldn't do that. And so it would be set to zero unless you decided to change it yourself. And then I want to know what max server memory is set to. That's really important. And you should not just leave it at the default. You should change it to an appropriate value based on what's running. Erlen? Yes. Yeah. No, setup will let you change it, or you can take the recommendation from it. So the point is, at least it's probably going to be changed more often than not, I think. Yeah, some of these are per database, but we're looking to the instance. And if you use a database scope configuration option, it'll override the instance level setting. So we'll get to that later. You guys keep getting ahead of me here, but that's good. So optimize for ad hoc workloads is another one that I think should be enabled. And that's also a new one that's a database scope configuration option in 2019. So those are the main ones that I like to look at pretty much every time. Another one that I usually like to ha have on is remote admin connections. Enable that in case you want to try to get in that way. So anyways, almost every instance I look at has problems here, especially if some non-DBA just installed SQL Server next, 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 although the setup program is getting better with each version at fixing some of those things. All right, the next one, DBCC trace status negative one. And that means show me all the global trace flags that are enabled right now. And Again, newer versions of SQL Server have less that they need to use. So 3226, anybody know what that does? Yeah, it suppresses any database backup messages, whether it's a full or a log backup. Because normally, every time you have any kind of a backup, it writes a message to the error log saying, hey, this backup succeeded. And backups succeed most of the time, right? And so I, you, if you turn this flag on, it stops doing that, and then it just writes a message if it fails. And you still have all the information in MSDB if you want to query it and look at it, but this keeps a lot of garbage out of your log and makes it easier to find stuff that's important. And then the next one is 7745, and that has to do with query store. And if you have a lot of activity and your query store is really busy, and it's taking up a lot of storage space, you've let it grow quite large. Well, what can happen is if it's really large on disk, it has to write what it has in memory out to disk as part of shutting down or failing over. And so that can take a long, long time. And if you turn this trace flag on, it won't do that. So it'll fail over more quickly or shut down more quickly. And there was another one that you had to use to, to change how it acted on startup, and that's on by default now in 2019. But if you're on 2016 or 2017, you need that one too, and I think it's 7752. But I've got it in the notes for that version of, of these queries. So those are the two that I think most people should have on. But a lot of the old ones you might have heard of, like 1118 and 2371, they're on by default, as long as you're on a compatibility level 130 or higher. So. There's a lot less trace flags you gotta worry about. So Microsoft's doing a good job of making it so there's less things you gotta do to a brand new SQL Server installation with newer versions of SQL is the point. All right, the next one, we're only on query six. Okay, the next one is gonna look at process memory. And that's the SQL Server process for this instance that you're connected to right now. And when I run this, well it helps if I highlight the whole thing, so anyways, when I run this, what this is going to tell me is how much memory is SQL Server actually using? And don't believe Task Manager. You know, some people will look in Task Manager, oh, it's using this much, that's wrong. This is 
correct. So I'm only using 777 megabytes of RAM right now. And the other one I look at is right here, the second column, SQL Server locked pages allocation and megabytes. If that's zero, that means you don't have locked pages and memory enabled. And I think that you should enable locked pages and memory on a production server. You know, Microsoft would probably tell you, oh no, you don't need to do that anymore. Because it used to be a big problem back in the SQL Server 2005 and Windows Server 2003 days that you would have device drivers had memory leaks and they would keep leaking memory until the OS became under memory pressure. So then it would ask all the services and applications to release some memory and they wouldn't do it quickly enough. So then they would actually go and page out a bunch of your memory and you'd get an error message and your performance would go in the toilet, right? This used to happen a lot. So lock pages in memory prevents that from happening. And Microsoft's official line used to be, you don't need to do that anymore because now SQL Server and the OS talk to each other better and it's not necessary. But I still see it very occasionally on modern versions of SQL Server. So I think you should enable it. That's my recommendation. But if you do that, make sure you set max server memory to a low enough value so the OS is never under memory pressure. That's really important. So that's my take on it. So anyways, you can see it here. And there's a couple other places you can see whether or not it's enabled. And then finally, there's these two flags here, process physical memory and process virtual memory low. I hardly ever see those set to one. But if you did, that would be SQL Server would be complaining that it was under memory pressure. There's other ways to figure that out, in my opinion. All right. The next one is really important in my opinion. This is gonna look at your services. So it's gonna tell you basically how long has SQL Server been running? And that's really important to understand when you're looking at some of the later queries in the set because it makes a big difference. Have you been running just for a few hours or a few days versus say six weeks or two months or whatever? Because if you're thinking about should I add this new index or not? Or should I drop this index that doesn't appear to being used? It makes a lot of difference how long you've been running. So that's why I want to know that. It also tells you things like what's your startup type and what's your process ID if you have multiple instances. Tells you what your service account is. Tells you again if you're in a failover cluster, a traditional failover cluster, and what your node name is. And then right here, instant file initialization. In case you don't know what that is, that's a right you can grant to the SQL Server service account at the OS level so it doesn't have to go through the step of zeroing out the data file when it's created or when it's grown. And this also comes into play if you're doing a backup or a restore from a full backup and you're not doing with replace. This comes into play. So I think you should have this turned on and this tells you now, yes, it's on, which is nice. It used to be harder to figure that out from inside of SQL Server. And this is in all the way back to 2014, SP2. They have that column there. It's still, it's still a local policy. The question is, can you change this within SQL Server, instant file initialization? No, it's in setup. So if you did it when you installed SQL Server, that's the best way to do it. But if you didn't do it, you've got to go into local group policy editor and do it yourself. All right, I'm sorry? Yeah, perform volume maintenance tasks is the right we're talking about for that. All right, the next one is gonna show us, did I just skip one? Yeah, I did. The last backup information by database. Why is my mouse have a mind of its own? All right, so this is gonna take a look at what's going on with all the databases on this instance, and I don't have that many here on purpose but it shows you the recovery model and it shows you the log reuse weight description, which is really important to monitor because if you're in full recovery model and your log reuse weight description is not nothing or if it's not log backup or oldest page, you've got some problem like replication or an availability group issue that's keeping the log from being cleared. And you basically have a runaway transaction log until you fix that. So I want to know, hey, I've got a problem that's not letting me clear the log. And so then this tells you when your last full backup was and your last differential and your last log backup for all your databases. So that's kind of nice to get all that in one little query. All right, the next one in the set is going to look at SQL Server agent jobs. 
And when I do that, it's going to show me all my agent jobs. So I'm a good DBA. I've got Ola Hallengren in here. How many people use Ola Hallengren? Good. It's, it's an awesome solution. And so I've got Ola Hallengren set up. And then the other thing I like to look at here when I look at a real instance is who are the job owners? It should be SA. It shouldn't be somebody's login. And that's really easy to change. And then it shows you when they're created and whether or not it's enabled. And also it tells you if you have a schedule enabled. So you can have a job that's enabled. That's what Ola does. When you first run Ola on here, he enables all the jobs, but there's no schedule. So they're never going to run unless there's a schedule, right? And then it shows you the next run date and next run time. And then I usually go in, like he does this, he sets them to database maintenance, but you can create your own categories and make it things easier to see what's going on. So I usually do that on my jobs. All right, the next one is SQL Server agent alert information. And alerts are different from jobs and they're different from you know, alerts that happen or notifications when a job fails. A lot of DBAs don't even seem to know these exist. But you can go in and create your own alerts for anything you want to, essentially. And what I do, and there's actually a script that I have a link to in this script that will create all these error or alerts that you see for you on your server. And so what this is doing is when you get certain kinds of problems that are related to corruption or hardware or storage or just SQL Server throwing certain errors, normally those just go into the SQL Server error log and you might not notice them, right? But if you create this and then rig that up so you, it sends a notification, then when one of these bad things happens, you'll find out immediately instead of maybe two weeks later. And so these are the things that I throw in there. And my script will create just like this and pick up your server name for you automatically. So it's pretty cool. All right here is the link to get the script to do it. OK. All right, the next one is host info. And of course, hopefully everybody knows that SQL Server 2017 and newer will run on Linux or on Windows. So that's why they changed this. So you're looking at host info instead of Windows info. And so when you run this, this tells you, OK, I'm running on Windows, not Linux. It's Windows 10 Pro. It tells you the exact SKU. So this is important in real life, because it might be Windows Server Standard Edition or Windows Server Data Center Edition. Now you know. And then it tells you the SKU, and then also the language. So this is US English. is 1033, for example. So you get all that from this. And I've got some codes down here that break down what all these different SKU numbers mean. So you have to try to memorize that. All right, the next one in the set is SQL Server NUMA node information. And NUMA is non-uniform memory access. And this shows you what's going on with your NUMA nodes. And this comes into play whether it's a bare metal server or a VM. Because depending on how they set up the VM, you might have you know, more than different numbers of NUMA nodes with different numbers of schedulers on them. And this is another thing you'll run into. So remember I talked about with SQL Server Standard Edition, and you've got that limit of 24 cores? Well, imagine you've got a two-socket server that has two 16-core processors in it, OK? So 16 here and 16 here. And you throw Standard Edition on there. What's going to happen? It's going to take 16 cores on the first NUMA node and then eight on the other one. And then you're done, because you can only have 24. And they're not going to be balanced. And that's the default, what happens when you install SQL Server Standard Edition on a box like that. And you can go in and fix it with an alter server configuration command, but you've got to do it. The setup program won't do it for you. It won't throw an error message or anything. It just does it that way. So this will help you spot that, because if you ran this query on that system, you'd see two NUMA nodes. And one of them would have 16 schedulers, and the other would have eight, right? So when you run this, make sure that all your NUMA nodes have the same number of schedulers. And this also comes into play on VMs. If somebody set up your VM some weird way, like I've seen VMs with 48 sockets, you know, and one core each, all sorts of weird things, you'll spot it here, because you'll see how the NUMA nodes look and how many schedulers are on each one. So it's a pretty useful query for spotting problems with VMs and with physical machines.
Yeah, the question is, what's the performance impact if the schedulers run ballots across your new ones? Well, it's bad. I mean, it depends on your workload, but think about it. You've got two sockets, and your memory split between the two sockets, and one of them has 16, the other has eight, and you're just not using all the, the resources of that second socket, but it still has half the memory, and so it's pretty bad. And so if you're in that situation, you know, you've got to run that ultra server configuration, make it 12 and 12 to even it out, and that'll be better, but you're still not getting what you paid for from a hardware perspective. And to make matters worse, Microsoft actually would expect you to pay for those cores that you can't even use. That's, I mean, they may not admit that, but that's what officially they would want you to do. So the moral of this story is if you know you're gonna be on standard edition, make sure you don't get a machine that exceeds those limits. Of course, these are per instance. So if you wanted to, you could have multiple instances on a big box and then use processor affinity to try to make sure you're using all the hardware. So just something to be aware of. You can set processor affinity, so you can say for this instance, only use these CPU cores. Yeah, you can control that if you want to. Most of the time you don't want to or don't need to, but if you really wanted to, you can do it, definitely, for each instance. All right, the next one's gonna look at system memory. So this is the operating system's view of what's going on with memory. And when I run this, it tells me I've got 16 gigs on my laptop, and I've got about nine available. And then my page file, which I don't really care about, to be honest, if I'm ever using the page file in SQL Server, I'm hating life. So I don't really look at that very much, but this one's really important, the system memory state. So you want it to say available physical memory is high. If it says it's low or steady or transitioning, that means that you're under external memory pressure. The operating system is under memory pressure and you don't want that, and especially if you have lock pages and memory enabled, you don't want that. Because if you get low enough on memory in the OS, the OS can lock up or crash completely. Yeah, the cure for this is either add more memory to the machine or give less memory to SQL Server by setting max server memory to a lower value. That's the only way you can really control it from a SQL Server perspective. All right, the next one, if I had a failover cluster instance, this query would tell me all the nodes in the instance and then who, which node owned the instance right now. But I don't on my laptop. And then the next one, if I had an AG set up on this, this would tell me the name of the AG cluster and the quorum type I was using and the quorum description. And it's interesting that it comes back that way. Normal node majority and normal quorum, I would expect it to come back empty. But anyways, that's that. And then the next one is if I did have an AG going here, this would tell me a lot of information about the health of the AG. You know, the transaction rate and whether it was caught up and all that good stuff. And I don't have that on my laptop either. All right, now we get to one of my favorite ones. This goes back to the question we got earlier about DMOS sysinfo. And this one, they keep adding more interesting stuff here in each new version of SQL Server, and they've improved it a lot. So this tells me I've got one socket in my laptop, which makes sense, and it's got four physical cores, and that's what licensing is based on, on non-virtualized instances. And then I have eight logical CPUs. How is that? How can I have eight logical CPUs and only four cores? Anybody know? Hyperthreading. And so Intel has hyperthreading and AMD has something called SMT, which is the same thing essentially. So that's why you have double if that's turned on. And then it tells me I've got one NUMA node. And, and you might be thinking, well, yeah, I've got one NUMA node because you only have one socket. But if you have an AMD Epic processor, depending on which version of Epic you have, you might have more than one Newman node per socket, and this would tell you that, okay? And then it tells you again how much physical memory you have, and tells you your processor affinity is set to auto. If you had gone in and messed with it yourself, it would say manual here. And then it tells you again when SQL Server started up, and then it tells you how many hours you've been up, 
And then right here, it says virtual machine type. And this one fools a lot of people because if you have a hypervisor installed, it's gonna say hypervisor here, even if you're not running in the hypervisor. So imagine you know, you've got a hypervisor installed and you just install SQL Server on the bare metal machine. So you have Hyper-V installed, but you don't install in Hyper-V. It'll stay, still say hypervisor here, okay? So don't let that fool you to think, oh yeah, I'm running in a VM, because you might not be. So that's important. This one here is soft NUMA configuration. So that's something they added in SQL Server 2016. If you have more than 16 cores in a socket, it'll automatically split into soft NUMA nodes for you. And if that's happened, you can override that so it doesn't do that. And so anyways, this is, that's not happening because I don't have that many cores. And then where it says memory model conventional, that means I don't have locked pages and memory enabled. Is there a question there? Yeah, for the NUMA configuration, you've got four cores. Yep. Well, the question has to do with how does memory and the number of cores relate to each other, I think. And, and what happens with NUMA is that each NUMA node has its portion of the memory. So if you had two sockets, you divide the memory in half, and each NUMA node has its own memory that's local memory. And it can still get to the other memory, but it's called a foreign memory access, and it's a lot slower. And you don't want that. So what you want to try to do is try to make sure, for example, if you're gonna create a VM on a box like that, that it's not what's called a wide VM. You want the number of cores and the amount of memory to fit on one NUMA node. Now there's no guarantee that it's gonna always try to use its own local resources, but by making sure it's not so big that it has to split it, then you're trying to, you have a better chance of that happening, okay? Is there a way to see that in these views? <sighs> Not that I know of. Yeah. Well, the only thing you could sort of do is you can find out, well, if you're in a VM already, you're just gonna see what the VM is. But if you can look at the physical machine and find out what kind of processor it is, and you can find out how many sockets are in the box and how much memory is there, you can kind of come up with, okay, it shouldn't be any bigger than this in terms of numbers of cores and how much memory, okay? All right, so moving on, this is how you find out for sure whether you're in a VM or not by looking at the manufacturer and the error log. And this is another one, if you recycle your error log, you're not gonna get this. It only happens on the actual startup. So this comes back, and in my case, it's an HP Spectra X30, X360, but if it was Hyper-V or VMware, it would say Microsoft Hyper-V, and that's how you confirm, yes, I'm running in a VM, okay? And otherwise, if it's a bare metal machine, now I know the manufacturer and model number of my server, so then I can go Google that and find out, is that a two socket or four socket? How old is it? You know, how much memory can it hold? All the gory details about that server. Okay, now the next one, is if you are running in VMware, there's a registry setting that VMware recommends that you turn on if you have a really heavy I.O. load. And so it's looking for that registry setting. And I'm not gonna run it here, because I'm, I'm not running in VMware, but that's something you might wanna look at, and I've got a link to the VMware KB article that explains this. So I've seen some pretty big performance improvements by turning that on if you're running in VMware. All right, the next one, is looking at the BIOS date, if I can get this to stop jumping around. And so this is the main BIOS in the Windows registry. And this is only important on bare metal machines. If it's a, a VM, this is not very helpful. But you might say, well, I don't care about that. I'm not a sysadmin. I don't take care of hardware. Why should I care about this? Well, the reason you care about this is that if you're running on, say, a Dell PowerEdge R740 server, and you go and run this, and the BIOS date is from a couple years ago, you know right off the bat, without even looking it up, that it's really old. And Dell pushes out updates, and all the server vendors do, to fix pretty major problems with reliability and performance. 
And this is especially important if you're running an AMD-based server, because they actually push out performance improvements with BIOS updates. So I want to know if I'm way, way behind on my BIOS and then find out, OK, let's get a plan in to get that up to date. And then another reason, if you ever have a hardware problem and you go to your hardware vendor to get support and they find out that you're on an ancient BIOS that's never been updated, they're going to try to blame you for the problem and want you to update it before they go much further. So it's kind of important to keep your eye on that, even if you don't care about hardware at all. All right, the next one is tell me what kind of processor do I have in the system? And this is so important. I get so frustrated when I talk to some DBA and I say, what kind of processor do you have in your mission critical server that you worry about the most? And they're like, I don't know, I think it's a Xeon. <laughs> Come on, you should know exactly what model processor you have in your most important database servers. Because number one, if it's really old and slow, that gives you an excuse for bad performance, right? You can blame the processor. But more seriously, you can always be bringing that up as part of building the case. Hey, SQL Server 2019's GA now. And our hardware, our processor is five years old and three generations behind. And, and whoever picked it in the first place didn't know what they were doing because they picked a real low-end processor. So there's all sorts of information you can get to help bolster your political case to upgrade your hardware and upgrade to SQL Server 2019. So you know, once you find out this, you can go and Google it and go to the Intel Arc database, for example, and get all the gory details about this processor, how old it is, and all its specifications. Because even I don't have them all memorized. So it's really useful to know that. All right, the next one is going to tell me if I had any SQL Server memory dumps. And that's when SQL Server is pretty unhappy, but it doesn't crash all the way, and it generates a memory dump. And when you run this, you want it to come back empty, like mine does. But if it doesn't come back empty, then it's going to show you when they happened and where the dump file is. And if you're Jonathan Kihayas, you can go in there with Windows Debugger or Bob Ward and crack open that file and find out what the problem was. But most of us can't do that. And so there's actually a couple text files that come with it. And you can open that up in a text editor and quite often get a decent idea of what's going on. And if you still can't figure out what the problem is, the first thing you want to do is make sure you get up to date on your service pack and CU. And if it still keeps happening, then you should open a support case with Microsoft so they can get those dump files. And a lot of times, they'll figure out, oh, yeah, we've got a problem in there. And they'll come up with a hot fix for the next CU. So that's how the dump files work. All righty. So the next one you should be looking at on a regular basis is looking at the suspect pages table. And so this is something in MSDB that whenever CheckDB runs or just during normal operations, if SQL Server notices some minor impending signs of corruption, it'll write a row to this suspect pages table. And you want it to come back empty like this. And if it doesn't, that means you've got a problem brewing. And you want to investigate, why is this happening? And if it ever comes back you know, not empty, it'll tell you the database it happened and what file, whether it was one of the data files or the log file, and the page ID, and then what the problem was and when it happened. And I've got some documentation here about what the different codes mean. And hopefully, you'll never, ever see any rows there. But if you do, you need to start worrying. OK. The next one is reading the error log again. So again, the same caveats. If you're recycling the error log, this will come back empty. But it tells you how many files you have in tempdb. And of course, SQL Server 2016 and newer will suggest a decent starting value for you, and you can change that yourself. So now you know, I've got eight data files. All right, the next one, we're starting to get into storage now a little bit. So this is going to show me where all my database files are for all the databases on the instance. And since I just have a C drive, it's a little boring here. But in case you do recycle your error log and that previous query comes back empty, you can see right here how many data files you have for tempdb. And what you want to look at here is, you know, hopefully not everything's on your C drive, on your real database instance, but you're looking for things like percent growth. 
is percent growth, you want that to be zero. And notice that Microsoft is still setting percent growth for the master database and also for MSDB. So that's something they should fix, in my opinion, but they just haven't done it yet. But you want to make sure all your database data files and log files don't have that set, so you can find it right here. And then you also want to look at what your growth is set to, and then it also shows you how big the files are. So that's kind of nice to know where the, your big files are in your file system, and if you have any of these other problems. Okay. So the next one is going to show me information <laughs> for all the fixed drives in the system, whether or not SQL Server files are on them or not. So in my case, I just have a C drive. It's a one terabyte SSD, and you can see how much available space it has. And then the next one in the set is going to tell me all my volume information for anywhere that I've got any SQL Server files. So again, it's just C, but I get some more information here. So it tells me if it's a mount point, what the name of it is, what the file system type is, how large it is, and how much space I have left. And this is really important because obviously you don't want to run out of space, right? That's bad. But you don't want to run low on space because if you have magnetic drives, running low on space can hurt the performance because on a magnetic drive, all the data starts off on the outside of the platter, and as the drive gets more full, it's in the center. And performance goes downhill, and your drives are starting to get full. And then on flash storage, you also have performance deterioration as you're getting full for a different reason, because it's harder to do trim operations and move stuff around to get contiguous free space. So you don't want to run low on space for performance reasons. So this helps you spot, oh yeah, I'm running low on space at the drive level. And again, this is going to just show only drives that have SQL Server database files on them. Yes, back there? I'm sorry? Oh, do you get it in Linux, the same information? Yeah, you do. Yeah. And that's a good question. I'm surprised nobody asked that. These queries work the same way on Linux as they do on Windows. I'm not aware of any of these that don't work or just break. And certain ones that used to have a problem, like the Windows info, they changed to host info. But all the rest of these ones, as far as I'm aware and the testing that I've done, they worked exactly the same way on Linux. Because remember, you have SQL OS that's doing most of the work. So it doesn't really matter to SQL whether it's Linux or Windows. You know, it's still getting the same information at this level. Yes? So the question is, does this have any information about the block size? I have not seen anything new in 2019 that adds that. And, you know, that sounds like a decent idea. You know, you should go on user voice and put a suggestion in there and try to get people to vote it up. You know, one thing you may not have seen, how many people have heard of Alan Hurt? Some of you have. He's a, a cluster MVP and a SQL MVP or data platform MVP. And he just recently put a user voice thing asking for a trace flag or a configuration option that would let you go into developer edition and make it act like standard edition. And that's been asked for many times in the past, and Microsoft's always shot it down. But it's gotten a lot of votes, and it's gotten some visibility. So if you f go find that one, go vote it up, because Microsoft will look at how many votes you get and sometimes change their mind. Yeah? On this page, it was like 5 or 10% free. Well, if, I was 10 if only 10%, I would be worried. Okay. I mean, I want to sandbag it and have lots of space, more than I'll ever need, because that way I'll get better performance and not have, have to worry about space. And of course, your infrastructure people don't like that. But the more space free, the better, in my opinion. But I'm biased, because I'm more of a DBA. All right, the next one is a query that Jimmy May originally wrote. And then I cleaned it up a little bit and changed it a little bit. But this is going to show you your average cumulative latency across your entire drive. And so you know, it's showing four milliseconds of read latency and zero for write latency. 
And when you run this in real life, you're going to see higher numbers here than you're going to see like you're looking at your sand tool or looking at Perfmon. And the reason for that is that this records everything that touches that file. So not just your regular workload, but things like index maintenance and running DBCC, check DB, everything that touches that file goes into these numbers. And plus, if you do something really intensive from an I.O. perspective, that's going to cause a real high spike in latency for a while, and that's going to make your average go higher. And this is a cumulative average since SQL Server has been running. So just make sure you're aware of that. So after that caveat, if you see numbers above about 25 to 30, then you want to start maybe investigating, hey, why is that? So another question here. Yeah. So I don't, if I look at the weight of the system, I don't see any problems with the I.O. But if I look at this, it says there's a big problem with the I.O. OK. Why is there a big difference? Yeah, so the question is, why is he seeing different numbers from this versus looking at the weight statistics numbers? And I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. I, this is looking at a specific DMV that's probably going through a different path. And what I would say to that, generally speaking, is that if you see high numbers here, then you want to look at the weight statistics and see if, weight, if your top weights are I.O. related or not. And you also want to look for 15 second I.O. warnings, which we're coming to pretty soon. That's another confirming measure of whether you're, oh yeah, you've got I.O. issues or not. So just this number by itself is not good enough reason to go screaming at your SAN admin. You need more evidence than just this. Right, you probably don't. You need both, really. I mean, you need this to be high, and you need to probably be having some 15 second I.O. warnings, plus you need your top weights to be I.O. related. So all those things together are pretty strong evidence of yes, you do have I.O. bottlenecks. Okay, now the next one is actually more useful. It uses the same DMV, but it drills in to the database file level. So when you run this, this shows you every single one of your database files and where it's located and how big it is, and then what your latency is for that, for reads and for writes. And what you'll usually see in real life when you run this, it's very common for your user database data files to have relatively high latency, and it's pretty common for your tempdb data files to have high write latency. I see that all the time. And so if you see that, there's things you can do you know, you want to go in and make sure that your cache policy is enabled if you have a RAID controller. You want to make sure it's dedicated to writes instead of reads. You know, you want to check your RAID level. You want to find out what kind of storage you're dealing with. You know, there's lots of things you can do to try to figure that out. And of course, there's tuning things you can do, like maybe using data compression or column store indexes or doing index tuning. There's lots of things you can do. And again, that's another thing I want to make sure I get out there, that if you see high numbers here, don't just go yelling at your SAN admin. What you should do as a DBA is what can I do to tune my workload to reduce how much pressure I'm putting on the storage subsystem? You know, and after you've done everything you can, that helps build your case, because you, then you can go to the SAN admin and say, well, look, we had high latency, but I went in and, and I dropped a bunch of indexes I wasn't using, I added some indexes I needed, I did some data compression, you know, I did a lot of stuff, to reduce my I.O. workload, and I'm still seeing high numbers. What can we do you know, to make this better? Don't just go in and accuse them, because that usually doesn't work very well. <laughs> well, it's like if you go into the doctor, and he's going to check your pulse and your blood pressure, even if there's no problem, because just to be sure. I mean. Yeah, but weight stats, the, thing, the problem with weight stats is if your server's running well, they don't help you very much, because it's always waiting on something. But if the server's not running well, the weight stats are more useful. Well, what I'm trying to say here is you need to look at the complete picture. 
And if you suspect you have an I.O. problem, I just talked about several things you can look at to try to figure out if you do or if you don't. And it's up to you to decide whether it's important or not, I guess. So Erlen. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, Erlen's point was that the difference of looking at cumulative versus what's happened recently. And what you could do if you wanted to is you could modify any of my queries to just look at a delta. Because my queries are looking at everything since SQL Server's been running for these IO weight stats. And if you wanted to, you could change it. So what's happened in the last hour, the last five minutes, that sort of thing. And of course, you can use third-party monitoring tools to do a lot of that stuff. But again, this is stuff that you're getting for free, you know, that you can modify to do whatever you want. So moving on, the next one is the 15-second I.O. warning. And this one is going to look at the last six SQL Server error logs and look for any 15-second I.O. warnings. And surprisingly, I actually do have one here on my pretty fast system. But this is really important. If you do get 15 second IO warnings, you want to figure out, is it happening at a certain time of day on the same files? Like every time you rebuild your index on a database, I get some 15 second IO warnings. If that's happening, that tells you one thing. Versus if it's just happening with no apparent pattern at different times of the day on different files, that's pretty strong evidence that your IO subsystem is not performing well. Right? So it tells you a completely different story. And it's a lot harder for your infrastructure people to blow this one off. If you have lots of 15 second IO warnings, it's kind of hard for them to say, oh, that's not a problem. Whereas the other ones, the previous two queries, a lot of times they will dismiss that and say, oh, well, the sand looks fine to me. But you know, this one's harder to dismiss. Maybe they still will, but. All right, the next one is looking to see if you're using any resource pools. So when you run this, you know, you get the internal pool and the default pool that are just there, whether you know it or not. But if you've gone and created any other ones, you can see what they're set at, you know, all the different things you can change. And you can see whether or not, you know, they how, they're the way you want. All right, so the next one is looking at your database properties. And this is something that I always find lots and lots of issues. Anytime I look at some strange people's uh, database instance, I find lots of problems with the database properties. And this is a lot more important than it used to be in the old days for several different reasons. So this tells you the database name and the database owner, which should be SA instead of somebody's login, like it is right here. No? OK. <laughs> All right, so anyways. <laughs> Erlen disagrees with that. So moving on here, the recovery model tells you that. And then it tells you your log reads weight description and how big your log is and how much you've used. But this one right here, database compatibility level, this is really important with modern versions of SQL Server. Because back in before 2014, this didn't really matter very much. All it really controlled was like whether certain new features were enabled or not. And it also had a little bit to do with backwards compatibility, but it didn't affect performance at all in most cases. But now you gotta be a lot more careful with this. And this, where this bites a lot of people who are upgrading from say SQL 20, 2005 or 2008 or 2008 R2 to say 2016 or 2017. A lot of people get bit really hard because they don't even realize how all this stuff works. And the first thing you gotta worry about is if you go to compatibility level 120 or higher, you get what used to be called the new cardinality estimator, and now they have a different one for each new version of SQL Server. And most queries work better with it, but some queries are much, much worse. So that's one that's very, very common. And then starting in SQL Server 2016, not only did it control that, but it controls a lot of other behaviors. Like for example, whether or not trace flag 1118 and 2371 are enabled by default, that's gated by the compatibility level. 
And also all this stuff you've heard about intelligent query processing and adaptive query processing, all those little features, those are controlled by your compatibility level. Now you can override it with database scope configuration options, but my point is you shouldn't just do what I call a blind upgrade. And I see a lot of people do this where they just go in and go from say SQL Server 2008 to SQL Server 2016 and they just restore the database to the new environment and then they change the compatibility level and just go into production. And sometimes they get lucky and sometimes they don't get lucky. And so then Monday morning when everybody starts using the system, they have a very stressful day that first day because they didn't do any testing to figure out what compatibility level should we use with our workload and what database scope configuration options and what trace flags should we use with our workload because the answer is gonna be different. And there's things you can use. Microsoft gives you some tools to try to figure this out. So they have something called a database experimentation assistant that lets you go in and capture a production workload and then replay it over and over again with different settings to figure out what's best for you. But my point is, do a little bit of research. I've written a bunch of blog posts about this so you don't get bit by this. Can you run a validity Excuse me? Can you set it back? Oh yeah, the compatibility level is different from the file level. So you can change this, whatever you want, to your heart's content. I mean, it flushes the plan cache when you do it, but you can change it. So you're not stuck in one place, yeah. So there's a question back there. Yeah, well that's related to this because one of the first database scope configuration options that they added in 2016 was legacy cardinality estimator. So you can go into the database level and even if you have it set to 130 or 140 to get the other things, you can force it to use a legacy cardinality estimator for that database. You can also do it at the query level with a query hint. So there's lots of ways you can control it. But what I would kind of suggest is a default thing if you haven't done your testing is start off at the legacy, card net, the legacy compatibility level first, and then try moving to the new one. And if you have problems, then try leaving it there and then turn on legacy cardinality estimation and see if that helps you. But there's so many different variables and the point is you really should try to do some testing instead of just guessing if you wanna have the best uh, solution here. Okay, the question is, there's another database scope configuration option called, uh, what is it, query optimizer hotfixes. And what that has to do with is, it, everybody hopefully has heard of trace flag 4199, and it used to be that you would not get those hotfixes unless you turn on 4199, but starting in SQL Server 2016, what they did is if you're on compatibility level 130, you'll get the effect of 4199 for everything up to RTM. But then all the service packs and CUs that come afterwards have their own query optimizer hotfixes and you won't get that unless you turn on 4199 for the instance or you go to the database scoped configuration option for the database and, and force it to be on. That's how that works. And my opinion, although some people don't agree with me, like Kimberly Tripp doesn't, but my opinion, is that you should turn that on. I've seen pretty big performance improvements from turning it on, but obviously you should test it if you can. But I've had really good results with a lot of my consulting clients by turning that on. But again, you should test with your workload to be safe. So moving on, because there's a few other things I want to point out here on this particular one. You also want to make sure page verify is set to checksum instead of torn page or none. I've seen people out there who think that if they set it to none, it'll improve performance, and that's not really true in any measurable way. You want to know what's going on with your statistics, you know, auto create, auto update, and auto update async. And I think they should be on most of the time, personally. You want to see what's going on with parameterization. Is it forced or not? You know, if you're using snapshot or RCSI, you never want to have auto close or auto shrink on. They're really evil. And then this one right here, a lot of people don't know about. This is something they added in 2016 and then backported to 2014. And 
what it does is it changes how checkpoints work. And you'll get better I.O. performance in most cases by going in and as long as your compatibility level is on a new enough level, and then you've got to change this from zero to some other value. And the most common one people will use is 60. And this will let it go through and do use dirty buffers instead of having to go through the entire uh, buffer pool to look for dirty pages. It tracks that and it will do things like backups will be quicker, startup and shutdown will be quicker. There's a whole list of things that work better and generally just get better I.O. performance. And this won't happen. If you do an upgrade, it doesn't change this. You've got to go in and change it yourself after you upgrade to the new version. So that's something I usually look at. And then you, know, you get more and more new things like delayed durability was added in 2014. That can help you if you have lots of uh, log write weights. And then you can see whether or not query store is enabled right here. And you get more stuff like temporal history. So you know, they add more columns here. Like now you can see if accelerated database recovery is on for this database right there. So a lot of good stuff in there. And seriously, every database instance I ever look at out in the field, I find problems here. So this is a good one to look at. All right. How are we doing on time for this session? About 10 minutes left? Yeah, yep, that's right. All right, this next one is one of my favorite ones, but it's also one that I kind of dread because people lose their minds over this. This is the missing indexes DMV. And the query optimizer keeps track of any index that it thinks it would like to have based on any query that ever gets run, you know, ever since SQL Server has been running or you've had an index change on that table. And the problem is, is that if you follow what it wants, you're going to over-index your database. And I've had people come up to me when I've presented this at PASS in the past, and they've said, well, you know, I like that missing index query, Glenn, but I changed it a little bit, so it automatically creates every one that it finds. <laughs> so please don't do that. So anyways, saying that, remember I told you it's really important to know how long you've been running? Well, the reason you want to know, one of the reasons, is see this index advantage number? Well, is 1475 significant or not? Well, it depends how long I've been running. If I've been just been running for a few hours and a really light workload, 1475 might be significant. But I've been running for several weeks. 1475 is trivial. So it's all relative. That's the first thing. And then the next thing you always want to look at is when was the last user seek? This, what this means, this is the last time that SQL Server wanted this index. And it was just a few minutes ago or a few seconds ago, and then you run this query again and it updates. What does that tell you? It tells you that whatever's happening is happening frequently, and it's part of your regular workload, and it's probably more important. Whereas if you ran this and the query date, the last user seek date was two weeks ago, that's probably just some ad hoc query or maybe a monthly report that's not run that often. So it might not be as important for your workload. So that's really important. And then if you scroll over to the right here, you want to look on these columns, so average user impact. That's the percentage that the query optimizer claims that the cost of the query would be reduced by if it had this index that it's begging for. So, you know, 99% is more important than 60%. And then the next one is the average total user cost. And this is what Kimberly used to call farkles, you know, is the unit of measurement. But it's just a measure of how expensive it is not to have this index. So you can see 18.81 versus 0 0.06. That means this is probably on a bigger table, usually. And then this tells you how many user seeks. So really low numbers here. But in real life, it could be millions, right? So that, that's how often this is happening. So that helps you kind of judge, is this really important or not? And then you want to start looking at some other things. Because in real life, what you're going to find is that quite often it'll come back and say, hey, I want 10 new indexes on this table. And that's usually not the right thing. And if you look closely, quite often you might be able to say, hey, look, it wants 10 indexes, but I could create a composite index that combines 
these 10 that it wants into maybe one or two wider indexes with more columns. So you always want to try to do that. It's better to have fewer wider indexes instead of a lot of narrow indexes in most cases. And then the other thing you got to be aware of is this thing, you can't always believe what it tells you in terms of the column order. So, and what I mean by that is it shows equality columns and then inequality columns. And that means it's part of your where clause or a join probably. And then included columns, you know, that's going to be an included column in your index and the order doesn't matter there, but the order matters a lot for these ones. And just because this thing says that feed ID should be first, that might not be true. A lot of times it is, but you really, if you really want to get this right, you should go in and run some queries to figure out you know, how selective that column is to try to make sure you get the best one first. So I just want to throw out all those caveats. So after all that, if you do find some really good ones that make sense and you do the extra research, you know, this can change your life, right? The right index is your most powerful tool as a DBA for making a big change that makes everybody think you're a rock star. So this is the best tool in your tool belt if you can do it correctly. Well, in SQL and Azure SQL database, they've got some auto tuning related to indexing, and I think that draws from this and does some other stuff. So that's how that works, as far as I know. You know, in in on in the box product, they don't have that yet. All they're doing is looking at regressions based on CPU effort. So if they notice if query store is running and they notice that a particular query regressed in terms of how much CPU was required, then they'll use the last known good plan. And so that's another case where Azure SQL Database is ahead of the box product in terms of features. So right there. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the question is, he's, he's found that if you have really complicated joins, this is not as helpful, and I agree. This is not a perfect tool, but it gives you a lot of good information that you can use in many cases to, to make a pretty easy improvement. But yeah, don't, like I said, that's why I start off, don't lose your mind and go and add 50 new indexes based on what this is telling you. That's usually the wrong answer. So we got all the way to query 34, so I'm gonna have to speed up probably to make it through the end. So the next one is VLF counts. And VLFs are virtual log files, and that's what you get whenever you grow your transaction log. You get more VLFs. And the problem that some people run into is if they have a database with the default settings for the size of the log growth, and you get a lot of auto grows, quite often you'll have a very high VLF count. And by high, I mean you know, above about two or 300. But, you know, you, sometimes you'll see it in the tens of thousands. And the reason you care about that is that it makes the recovery portion of a restore take longer. And every time SQL Server starts up, all your databases go through crash recovery. So if you're failing over from one node to another in a cluster, that's gonna take a lot longer if you have a high VLF count. Another reason you care about it is it has a, a bad effect on write performance of the transaction log. So you want to keep your VLF counts low. And the way you do that is you, know, you shrink that log file after you do a log backup. And you might have to do more than one of that sequence to actually get it to shrink. So anyways, with that little background, this is a query that will show you what your VLF counts are for all your databases. And you know, 68. It's perfectly fine, but if this was 68,000, I'd want to go in and do something about it. And the way you keep it from coming back is that you go in and change your auto growth increment to a larger value, and then you have it grow in larger chunks instead of lots of small growths. That's how you fix this, essentially. And a lot of instances I look at have problems with this. It's a very common problem. So the next one in the set is let's see, say that you're seeing some signs of CPU pressure on your instance. So I want to know what database is causing the most pain from a CPU perspective. So when I run this query right here, it's going to tell me which database has been using the most CPU. Now, the caveat here is it's just looking at the plans, the query plans and the plan cache. 
So this might not be accurate you know, over your total workload, but this is what it is as of what's in the plan cache right now. So if I was under CPU pressure, you know, the culprit is obviously this AdventureWorks LT 2008R2 database. He's using most of the CPU according to the plan cache. So then the next one you might want to run is oh, what's going on from an I.O. perspective. And of course, this is using that same virtual file stats DMV that tracking everything that touches the file. But this is going to show you the breakdown by database, both in terms of total I.O. and then also reads and writes and percentages. So this helps you start to figure out, is this more of an OLTP workload or more of a reporting workload, for example, and which database is using the most I.O.? But another caveat here is that this is including things like backups, right? So if it's a really big database and it's not actually being hit that hard as part of your workload, but just the backups are going to go into this. So they're going to have more I.O. just because of the size of the database, if that makes sense. So that's for I.O. And then the next one is looking at buffer usage. And this one can take a long time to come back. If you've got you know, two terabytes of RAM on your database server or something, this might take a while to come back. But anyways, it shows you which databases are using the most space in the buffer pool. And that's something I want to know. If I'm under memory pressure, which database is using the most memory? All right. And then if you're using RCSI or now an accelerated database recovery, although this is actually, never mind, forget I said that. This is only for if you're using uh, RCSI. This is showing you IntentDB, the version store space usage by database. So if you are doing that and you're kind of curious about what's, which databases are causing you the most pain in IntentDB, this would tell you, okay? Read committed snapshot isolation. You know, it's an isolation level you can set to try to get around blocking issues. And instead of using locks and, and, and blocks, it's going to use the version store instead. So it makes it act more like Oracle, essentially. OK. All right, here is another query that people lose their minds over. This is the cumulative top weight stats query. And this is a great big query in terms of just how long, how many lines it is. But this is going to show you what SQL Server has spent the most time waiting on since it last started or since you cleared the wait stats. There's a DBCC command you can run to clear the wait stats. And I recommend you do that. If you go in and make a configuration change or add a new index, you know, something fairly major, you probably want to clear your wait stats so that you're not getting all the old information blended in with what's happening currently. And you can also modify this query to go get a delta since a certain time. But this one, as it's written, is cumulative, OK? So that's the first thing. And the reason why people lose their minds here is that if your server is running really well and you've got plenty of time to surf the internet instead of working, right? then this is not that useful. But if your server is running poorly and everybody's upset, this query can be very useful to point you in one direction or another to do further data gathering and analysis. So that's the first thing. And then the second caveat to this query is, if you're, especially if your server is running pretty well, and you run this, and you find, OK, CX packet, that's your top weight type. Imagine that it's number one. Anyways. So if that's, if that's the case, what a lot of people will do is they'll Google CX packet weights. And then they'll find some blog post or forum post from five years ago or more that says, oh, if you have high CX packet weights, you should set max stop to one. And that will fix it, <laughs> right? You'll, seriously, you'll find that kind of guidance out there. And that's usually the wrong answer. I mean, that'll make CX packet weights go away, but you disabled parallelism at the instance level. And so don't do that. Paul Randall calls that knee-jerk performance tuning. You run this query, and whatever the top weight stat is, you go Google it, and then they tell you to do something, and you just do it without any further analysis or thought. And that's usually the wrong answer. You know? And what this is useful for is that 
it'll point you, oh yeah, maybe it's I.O. related, or maybe it's CPU related, or maybe I'm seeing blocking, you know, whatever. And there's about 700 different wait types, depending on what version of SQL Server you're talking about. And so, anyways, here is the wait percentage. So I've spent 71% of my time waiting on SOS scheduler yield, is what this is telling me. And then it tells me how long it is. And that's important, is it very short or is it longer? Well, SOS scheduler yield means it's sort of indirectly CPU. What it means is it's having to yield to another thread after a certain amount of time. And so usually if you're under CPU pressure, this will be high, but it doesn't actually mean CPU pressure. Paul Randall would get mad if he heard me saying that it means CPU pressure. It's sort of related to it. But so anyways, Getting back to this, what you want to do instead of just going to the internet is follow this link right here. And it goes back to sqlskills.com and Paul has been documenting wait types for several years. And so if you click on this link, it'll pull up a page that explains what this means and what, if anything, you might want to do if you see it. But the main thing I want you to remember don't just run this query and just start making changes willy-nilly. You want to, okay, it looks like it might be CPU related. What else can I do to figure out if it really is or not? And then what should I do, if anything? But don't just start turning knobs after running this query in most cases. So I've got a bunch of links here. And there's some good old white papers that explain how to look at weight stats, generally speaking. So that's what all these links are about, all right? So now the next one is going to show me all my SQL connections by IP address. And of course, this will be pretty boring on my laptop. It's all local machine. But in real life, this will show you all your web servers and application servers and people's workstations and how they're coming in and hitting it and how many connections. And this is useful to kind of gauge your workload. Is it kind of normal or something happened? I'm seeing a lot more connections than normal. It's also good. If, if support comes to you and says, oh, SQL Server's down because this web server can't connect to it, and then you see connections from it right here to that web server, for example. So it's pretty useful that way. All right, this next one, average task counts. This is really useful to get a real quick and dirty high-level view about what SQL Server's unhappy about. And notice how I'm running it multiple times. If I was doing this on a live production server, these numbers would probably be jumping around a little bit. And what you want to look for here is average task count. That is average across all your schedulers, how many tasks each scheduler has. And if this is above about 10 to 15 for an on-premises SQL server, that either means that your server is really busy or you're seeing lots of blocking and possibly deadlocking. That's what that means. But if it's you no know, four or two, then that's not happening. Your server's not very busy, and you're not seeing locking and blocking. And then average runnable task count, if this is ever above zero, that means you have runnable tasks, which means they're waiting for CPU time. And that's another indirect indicator of CPU pressure. So you want this to be zero, but if it's, you see it going to one or two or more, that means you've got lots of tasks waiting for CPU time. And then this one's kind of self-explanatory. You've got tasks waiting for disk I.O. to complete. So you don't want this above zero. And so, you know, I used to expose this in a dashboard to DevOps type people or, you know, sysadmin type people. So just by running this, you have a pretty decent idea. Is it just activity or blocking? Or is it CPU related possibly or I.O. related? Just by running this one query, it's very, very useful. Okay. Not really. It's sort of a judge of how busy each uh, scheduler is. But yeah, I probably should put some comments about what that really means. I don't really pay attention to it, to be honest. I don't know why I put it in there, just because I added it. Usually, I go crazy. If they add a new column, I like to add it. And then sometimes I try to figure out, what does that really mean, right? So all right. No, that's not true. The question is, if you have a lot of CPUs, it can be higher. No, this is the average across all your schedulers. And so it doesn't matter how many schedulers you have. 
So if it's, if it's really high, and then the other caveat I want to throw out there, if you're using Azure SQL database and you're using a pretty low version of it that doesn't have a whole lot of resources, it's pretty common to see those numbers a lot higher, especially for average task count. That kind of blew my mind the first few times that I ran this against Azure SQL database instances that were small and I'd see like 50 or 100 and I'm like, oh my God. But then I started looking at it and it's because they only have say two cores or four cores and they're just gonna be busy sitting there doing nothing, right? And you really don't wanna be running SQL Server on a teeny tiny Azure SQL VM or Azure SQL database level anyways, if you can avoid it. So anyways, getting back to this, if you did see really high average task counts, then you should run this query that's gonna show you blocking. And you know it's come back empty now, but if you were seeing blocking, it would show you what was happening, who was blocking who, and what the resource weight type was, and so it's pretty helpful for tracking that down. Now, if you were seeing signs of CPU pressure, this query, looks at DMOS ring buffers to show you SQL Server CPU utilization in one minute increments for the last four hours. So it lets you go back in time for four hours. And right here is, you know, since I've been up here yammering all this time, it's usually zero. But on a real instance, it's gonna be 20, 30, 40%, whatever it is. And, and the, what's useful here, as you can see, is the CPU been pegged for the last four hours or the last five minutes? So that's very useful to know. And then it also shows you other process CPU utilizations. That's other stuff like PowerPoint and Management Studio that I'm running on that machine that's using up CPU. And if this is above about 5%, I wanna to get to the bottom of that. Who's using my CPU on the SQL Server instance for something besides SQL Server? And then the other thing I'll throw out there is that this particular DMV is not documented or supported really by Microsoft. And so I get an email about every week or two from somebody that says, hey, this query doesn't work because I get negative numbers or I get numbers above 100. And they're like really upset. Why doesn't it work? Fix it. I'm sorry, I can't fix it. You know, and, I've, and, I, and when I get one of these emails, I forward it to a bunch of my friends at Microsoft. Hey guys, this is coming up again. And so far there's been no interest in fixing it, right? And where it usually happens, in my experience, is if you've got a big machine with more than 64 cores, then sometimes the numbers will come back and be like, you know, 150 or negative 100, just crazy. So if that happens, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for you, unfortunately. So, but it, most of the time it works really well. So getting back to this, if you, again, if you see signs of CPU pressure, then you can run this query and it's gonna show you across your entire instance, what queries are using the most total worker time? And worker time means CPU effort, okay? And so now it shows you the database, and then I got the short query text here, and a bunch of other statistics here. And another thing I do is I've got has missing index. You've probably all seen the missing index warnings in green in a graphical execution plan, or maybe you've seen it in the XML, right? And so this is telling me that these top three that are showing up here have missing index warnings associated with them. And if I wanted to, I could go back to this query and see I've got this line commented out, so the complete query text and also the query plan. You can uncomment that and run it again, and then you can get a link that shows you the, exec the execution plan, the estimated execution plan actually. And so that'll show you what the missing index is that it thinks that it wants. And that's kind of useful because now you know what query or what store procedure is generating that request. And it might be an easy win for you. If it turns out that my CPU is under pressure, I got lots of evidence of that. And then I run this query and it shows me this one query or store procedure and this one database is the biggest culprit and it's got a missing index warning. That might be really easy to fix if you're lucky. So that's something you always wanna be on the lookout for, okay? And then the other thing I want to show you, it's going to happen a lot on a lot of these, these queries that we're going to do, is see how these numbers in total worker time, how they just fall off really quickly. You know, this one, and then this one, and then this one's about half, and then it goes down really fast. And you'll see that pattern over and over again. So you might be saying, 
this is overwhelming. It's pulling back so much data. How can I ever look at that? But usually if you look at, look at the top three or four or five rows and work on those, you're going to make a big impact on your workload. So that's what you want to be on the lookout for. All right, so the next one is page life expectancy, PLE. And that's a perfmon counter that we can get to from T-SQL here. And this is telling us how many seconds is data living in the buffer pool before it has to get flushed out due to memory pressure, like with a checkpoint, for example. And you want this to be high. Higher is better. And you may have heard old guidance from 15, 20 years ago almost that 300 was a threshold. If you were above 300, it's great. If you're below 300, it's bad, right? Well, that's no good anymore. That was back in the days when database servers had like four gigabytes of RAM kind of thing. And now it depends on how much memory you have, whether this is a good value or not. And you shouldn't just run this once and decide, oh, it's good or oh, it's bad. You want to be looking at it periodically because it's going to change at different times of the day and different days of the week. And one big query, great big table scan, can make this go down to zero, right? but it should hopefully start to come back up. And so you want to keep an eye on this. But having said all that, this is a pretty good way to judge, are you under internal memory pressure or not? If this is a nice high number, then you're probably not under internal memory pressure. All right, the next one is memory grants pending. And this is another perfmon counter. And this should always, always be zero. If this is ever above zero, this is SQL Server screaming bloody murder that it's under memory pressure. Because it means it can't get a memory grant for something it wants to do. And that's really, really bad. So you know, if you ever see this above zero, you're probably going to see PLE really low at the same time. And th but then what usually what happens is maybe PLE is low, but this is still zero. Okay, That's the most common thing that I'll see. All right, so you might be thinking, OK, look, yes? Yeah, you'd see weight stats related to that. And like maybe query semaphore is one that I think is related to that. So yeah, you'll see other symptoms. So the next one is going to look at the memory clerk. And this shows you what's using your memory. And if you're on SQL Server 2012 or newer, what you want to see is memory clerk SQL buffer pool. That's your SQL Server buffer pool, and that's where your data is cached in memory, and you want that to be using lots of memory. But what you might see a lot, unfortunately, is if we go back to the editor, cache store SQL CP, this one. That is ad hoc and prepared plans in the plan cache. And if you don't have optimized for ad hoc workloads enabled, it's very likely you're going to see a really high value there, like you know, 8, 16, 20 gigabytes or more. And that's plans that are cached that are ad hoc or prepared queries instead of parameterized queries or stored procedures. And quite often, there's another query we're going to run in a second. You can go and look at the use count of all those plans in the plan cache, and you'll find a lot of them have a use count of 1. And they'd be very, very similar, just off by a little bit, so they get its own separate plan. And optimizer and ad hoc workloads is supposed to help fix that, and it does, but it doesn't completely fix it. So what you need to do in many cases is periodically flush that cache with a command I'm going to show you to try to control that even better. So, and the command I'm talking about is right here, dbcc free system cache SQL plans. I've got a lot of my clients who have an agent job that'll just run that periodically to clear that cache out. And that helps control that. And the reason you care is you're just wasting that memory that could be used to cache data in the buffer pool. Yes? That does also have the opposite problem that, uh, that my plan cache is flushed out. Yeah. So if you're for that, because uh, I was, you cannot control this buffer. No, you don't really have any control over the buffer sizes. And yeah, I've seen in SQL Server 2016 and 2017, it's kind of mysterious. Every once in a while, for no apparent reason, the plans just flush themselves. And I'm not sure why that happens, but I've seen it happen plenty of times. This even happened in demos. You know, something happens and it just, all your plans that were in there were just gone. And nothing that you did seemed to have triggered that. And I see Jonathan standing back there. He probably knows the answer, but anyways. 
I don't know the answer why that happens. I don't know. The answer is, is there any way you can find out why it flushed, you know, what caused it to flush? I mean, if you do something like run a dbcc command yourself, it'll go in the error log that, hey, this command was run that flushed a certain part of the cache. But for other reasons, I don't know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Erlen has a... Yeah, yeah, that DMV you were talking about with the clock hands is a good way to try to understand what's happening. And then extended events would also give you more information, but that's you know more of a Jonathan thing that he would understand better than I do. So moving along here, if you did see lots of, uh, of those ad hoc and prepared plans in the cache, you can run this query. And it comes back empty for me, but in real life, that hardly ever happens. And this just shows you all the plans of that sort that only have a use count of one. And that you want to look into that and figure out. And usually it's because somebody's doing something like entity framework, for example, that's generating lots of ad hoc queries. You know, and you can do things to control that, like optimize for ad hoc workloads and flushing the cache yourself. But the ultimate thing is to talk to the developers and try to get them to not do that as much as possible. And that can be difficult in real life, I understand, but that's what you want to try to do. So Moving along, if you did feel like you're under memory pressure, then if you look at this one, it's going to show you the queries that have the highest number of logical reads, which sort of indirectly causes memory pressure. And this is going to, again, you'll see this pattern of the numbers falling off really quickly. So the top one is much higher, double the second one. And it goes down really quickly. And you get all the same information, you know, all these different statistics. And the execution count is very useful, and also the missing index warning right here. So again, that could be an easy win, where if you can find, oh yeah, this one index would help make that query a lot more uh, efficient. All right, the next one is finding all the queries and sorting on average elapsed time that are in the plan cache across the entire instance. And this is another thing that you're looking for that if you can find that query that takes 30 seconds and do your DBA magic and make it come back in less than a second, people are going to think you're a genius, right? Even though it's not that hard sometimes, but they think you're so smart because you could do that. So this helps you find that low-hanging fruit. You know, so I, I'm always on the lookout for that. And what I want to point out is these elapsed times are in microseconds, not milliseconds. So this one right here you know, is what, about 1.6 seconds. So that's not really that long, but that's what I'd look at first if I was trying to find that easy tuning opportunity. All right, the next one is looking at scalar UDF statistics across the entire instance. And this is something in SQL Server 2019, you know, you probably heard in the keynote, if you hadn't heard of it already, that you've got automatic scalar UDF inlining if you change your compatibility level to 150. And that works really well. In fact, it works so well that some of the queries I used to run to trigger it, they're not showing up here. And this is the way you can find out if it's actually working for you. So what I mean by that is you could take, say, like a SQL Server 2017 database with a lot of scalar UDFs and run this query and see them show up here, right? And then if you just restore that to a 2019 instance in a test environment and run those same queries again in compatibility level in 50, all the ones that got inlined will disappear from this query. And you can see that they got inlined. And there's actually another DMV you can look at to see is it inlineable or not to identify them ahead of time. And what I kind of noticed when I was playing with 2019 in the past is these are all ones from Microsoft. These are scalar UDFs from Microsoft and MSDB. They're not getting inlined, even though they should. And they actually show up, show up as inlineable if you look at it with that other DMV. 
So I've bugged some people at Microsoft, why is this? Why, has, why is these not getting inlined? And I haven't gotten an answer yet. But anyways, that's kind of interesting. So now we finally finished John. Okay. All right, good. That's good information. So there's more information in the documentation about why it's not being inlined, according to John. So anyways, getting back to this, all these queries we just ran up until now were instance level. It doesn't matter what database you're connected to. But now we're going to switch to the database we care about. And make sure you do that. And that's why I say use your database name here. And I've gotten emails, but I don't have a database with that name. So <laughs> this just means switch to the database that you want to look at, OK? So anyways, we run this first one. And this is going to just tell us what's going on with the files in this database. And you know, this database does the typical bad thing that most people do. They have one data file in the primary file group, and then they have their log file. Please stop doing that. And when you create new databases, what you should get in the habit of doing is create one more file group at least, and then have, say, two data files or four data files in that file group. And it's not really for performance reasons necessarily, just more for administrative purposes. Instead of having this huge one data file, you've got multiple smaller data files that you could move somewhere if you needed to for space or performance reasons in the future. If you do that from the get-go, instead of having to do it later and then moving stuff from one file group to another. So if you would try to start doing that, it would be better. And then you see also, I was a bad DBA in the past, because what do you see here? The log file is eight times as big as the data file. So I had a runaway transaction log probably at some point in the past. But this shows you how big your files are and how much space they have available in them. And then it shows you things like, is it percent growth, which is bad? Yes? OK. So what's the better option? OK, the question has to do with where she works. She's not allowed to have auto grow turned on. So they're constantly having to manually grow them when they run out of space. And what do I recommend? Well, what I recommend is that you should manage your space manually as much as you can and make sure you have plenty of space, but leave auto grow on just in case. And I don't understand why they don't want to do that. I mean, because you can limit the total size to make sure you don't run out of disk space. but yeah, I don't, I don't know why they want to do that. In my opinion, you should have it turned on, but you should manage it yourself as much as possible so it doesn't ever have to auto-grow. It's just there as a safety measure in case you run out of space. So anyways, getting back to this, you know, percent growth, you don't want that on, in my opinion. And then this is about auto-grow all files. That's a new thing they added in 2016, whether or not that's turned on or not. So a lot of good information about your database files. Yeah, it still does. So, so the question has to do with whether or not it makes a difference how big the files are. And you do want them all the same size, because if you have one really big file and a bunch of small files, the small files will pretty much get ignored, and all the work will go to the big file. So you want to try to make all your files the same size in the same file group. And it's really important for tempdb that all your data files are the same size. So anyways, the next one is an, something they added in 2016. So it's log space usage in the current database. And why this you might care about this is most people have set up, based on their RPO requirements, how often they take log backups. So every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, whatever, right? But what you can do if you wanted to in 2016 or newer is you could have something that triggers on how much space you've used. 
So that way you might take log backups more often if you're using a whole bunch or less often if you're not using as much. So it's called intelligent log backups, kind of the idea. And I think Ola Hallengren supports it in his script if you set the right parameters. But this lets you check that and decide. And also this could be useful if you're trying to decide, should I do a differential backup or a full backup? You know, figuring out how much activity has happened, it could be useful for that. So, Well, I think it's the use size. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by committed size. Oh. Well, I think what happens in a great big transaction like that is it, it takes a grant like it's going to, it assumes it's going to finish. So it takes a bu bunch of space in advance. But yeah, I don't want to get total sidetracked on that because I got to keep going here. So anyways, the next one is the status of the last VLF in the current database. and. How many people have ever gone in and tried to shrink their transaction log file and it didn't shrink? Has that ever happened? And so it could be that maybe you've got an open transaction or something is happening, right? The, the log can't be reused. But let's say that's not the case. And your log reuse weight description says log backup, right? So then you go and take a transaction log backup and you try to shrink it and it doesn't shrink, right? So then what a lot of people do is they'll take another log backup and then try to shrink it and it still doesn't shrink, right? That's happened to me multiple times. And so what's really probably happening there is just depending on what's happening with that last VLF, it won't release and you can't shrink it. So what you need to do, the little trick, is go do something like reorganize an index just to generate some log activity and that'll move that last VLF and change its status. And then if you go and try to shrink it again, usually it'll shrink. And that's the way to kind of get around that problem. And this will help you figure out why that's happening. And I don't remember, yeah, I've got some status values, what they mean down here, but that's why I put that one in here. If you're having problems shrinking your log file, this will help you figure it out. But the trick is just generate some log activity and try again, and usually it'll work. Well, checkpoint is only valid in simple recovery model. If you do a checkpoint in full recovery model, it's not going to have any effect on this. You've got to do a log backup. Checkpoint won't help in full recovery model. In simple, it will, because as soon as you do a checkpoint in simple, the whole log will be reused. So, but it's different in full recovery model. Yes? Yeah, the question is, is generating some activity more effective than just letting the log file grow, I think. Well, yeah, so the question is, could you just go in and manually grow it yourself to change it? Yeah, that might work, but you're gonna add more VLFs there. And hopefully what you've decided over time is, my log file needs to be 32 gigabytes for my normal activity. And so once you've kind of got it where you want it, I don't really want to just grow it a little bit just to fix that. I'd rather do what I'm talking about to fix it, but you know, whatever works for you. So moving on here, database scope configuration values, and these are a new feature, very, very useful in 2016. And they've added, look at this, it's crazy. How many of these these have added? And what these things are, these are things that you can now set at the database level instead of just at the instance level with a instance level configuration setting or a trace flag. And not only can you set it at the, excuse me, at the database level, you can set it one way for a primary and an availability group and another way for the secondary. And one place this is really handy is like if you're doing SharePoint databases, and I feel sorry for you if you do, <laughs> but you know, SharePoint wants you to set max stop to one for SharePoint, but if you've got SharePoint databases and non-SharePoint databases on the same instance, that really hurts you. So now you can set your SharePoint to one and then your non-SharePoint to whatever you want. So it's really useful. And here's you know, the legacy cardinality estimation one to let you trigger that at the database level. So there's more and more things they have in here. So you need to keep up with this if you're gonna be moving to 2019 because in 2016, they only had these first four rows. And then they added one more in 2017. 
And then all these other ones came in 2019, so it just exploded. And I actually like this. I, it gives me more knobs to tune, right? But just be aware of that, because some of these are pretty important. Okay. The next one is what's been going on with my database files in the current database in terms of reads and writes and percentages. So, you know, this shows me my one data file and how big it is. How many reads and how many writes is that data file seen? And the same way for the log file. So this helps you figure out, is it more of an OLTP workload or more of a reporting workload? Do I have something like replication or availability groups that's generating writes against the log file, for example? So this helps you figure that out instead of just guessing. And this is really important when you're trying to figure out, do I need to upgrade my storage? Or if I'm getting ready to move to a new server, do I need flash storage? Or I need, you know, Optane storage? What RAID level should I use? You know, instead of guessing, now you know from the numbers what kind of I.O. workload you've been seeing against that database. All right. The next one is going to look at the most frequently executed queries in this database. And this includes just regular queries and store procedures. And so it's going to show you your execution counts and then all your useful statistics about that. And where this is useful is if you're trying to figure out, hey, maybe we can do some caching in the middle tier, or maybe there's a problem in the application where they're calling a query twice or three times instead of once. I've seen that a lot. And this also just helps you gauge your workload. So normally you know which store procedures call the most often and if suddenly it changes, you know, you want to maybe investigate what happened. Did they do a code load or we ran a Super Bowl ad and we're getting a lot more traffic? You know, something changed. So now, notice I say these queries 58 through 63 are the bad man list for store procedures. And what I mean by that is back when I worked at NewsGator 10 years ago, I would collect these bad man queries about every week or so and put them in a spreadsheet and then send them out to all the developers. And they knew which store procedures that they had worked on or wrote in the first place, and they didn't want to be at the top of the bad man list. <laughs> and so it was a really good way, because we were all working as a team to make the application faster. So when you run this in real life, you're going to find quite often the same store procedures at the top of the list from all these different perspectives. So this first one is just by execution count. Which store procedures in the current database are called the most often? So that's the first one. And then the next one, we're going to go in and figure out, OK, which ones have the highest average elapsed time? And again, this is in microseconds, not milliseconds. So this helps you find those easy tuning opportunities, hopefully. And on all of these, you're going to get things like the name of the store procedure and then the times. And then if you scroll over to the right a little bit, you're going to get the missing index warning, if it's there or not. And also, what I've done is I comment out this one line here. It gives you the query plan. And the reason I do that is that if you copy this into Excel, all that XML that comes back is really ugly and hard to read, so usually I filter that out. But if I'm doing this live and I want to look at the query plan, you know, I can uncomment that and run it again. Okay. So then the next one is just looking at worker time. And what does worker time tell us? CPU. So this is going to show me what store procedures in this database are using the most CPU. And hopefully we figured out from those earlier queries which database is using the most CPU. So now we're trying to narrow in on what is causing all this CPU effort instead of just guessing. So again, see this pattern? The numbers fall off really quickly. And even though this is the little trivial test workload, you see the same thing in real life. You know, if you focus on these top three or top five, and go in and look at them and see what you can, you can do to make them better, I guarantee you're going to make things better if you do this over and over. So that's top worker time. The next one is looking at top logical reads. So when I run this, this shows me which ones have the most logical reads. And logical reads means you're finding it in the buffer pool instead of having to go out to storage to get it. So again, the numbers fall off really quickly. And what I mean is, this get event log by feed ID seems to be really bad. He's showing up at the top 
on most of these queries. He's at the top of the bad man list. He's the most wanted. So we need to go look at that guy as a priority to try to figure out what, if anything, we can do to make it better. All right, the next one is looking at total physical reads. And that means you're having to go out to storage instead of finding it in the buffer pool. So, you know, it's a different one in this case. So this shows us where to look for that. The next one looks at total logical writes. So this is showing which store procedures have the most write activity. And a lot of times there's not too much you can do about that, but a lot of times you can go in and look and see what they're doing to make sure they're not doing something that's inefficient. You know, maybe they're having to do a table scan to find the, the row they need to update and the update store procedure so you can help tune it that way perhaps. All right, and the final one in this sort of related set is top IO statements. And this is gonna show me which statements within the store procedure are generating the most IO. So, you know, 24,057 IOs are being generated by this select statement. And the complete statement is here that I could copy and stick in another window. And it's in this store procedure, so that shows me in the store procedure, without even looking at the execution plan, what part of it is most expensive from an I.O. perspective. All right, the next one is very useful, but you've got to be careful with it. This is looking for what I call bad non-clustered indexes. And what I mean by that, it just has more writes than it has reads. But you've got to be careful here, because this is where it makes a big difference how long you've been running. If you've only been running for a day or two, and you run this, and you find a whole bunch of indexes that have zero reads, should you, drop, should you drop those? Probably not, because you probably haven't seen your complete business process. And maybe there's reports that are run once a month or once a week that you just haven't seen yet. And if you go and drop those indexes, you're going to kill the performance for those queries, right? So you need to make sure you've been running long enough that you can trust what this tells you. And then if that's the case, what I would do is I would probably just go in and one by one drop the indexes but script them out before I drop them. I don't disable them, I just script them out first and then drop them and make sure the world doesn't end, right? And if it does, I can put the index back on there. But hopefully, if I've done my due diligence, you know, this won't bite me. But just be careful, because I've had people go crazy. They run this, oh look, I can drop 100 indexes. And that's probably not true in most cases. Although, if people have been going crazy with a query tuning advisor, and there's lots and lots of indexes that aren't being used, you know, you might be able to drop 100 indexes, but you just need to be careful about how you do it. Well, you do know how long you've been running. You can look at queries how long it's been running, but the index stuff don't get flushed here, the usage statistics. Okay. Well, I'm thinking of more like from the missing index. It'll disappear from the missing index stuff, but I don't think, but I don't know. I'd have to check that. So, yeah, you might be right. Yeah, that's something I should check. But anyways, let me move on here. So the next one is the missing indexes for the current database by index advantage. So it's the same as the previous one, but it's filtered down to this database only. And I add two more columns to it. And I throw them over here at the right. So what I do is show you how many rows are in the table and what table it is again. And why do you think I do that? Why should that matter? Yeah, well, that's one th reason, but what if you're on standard edition versus enterprise edition? Would that matter? Yeah, online exec operations, you don't have that in standard edition, right? So depending on how fast your I.O. is and your CPU to a certain extent, 
If you've got standard edition, but you only got like maybe two million or five million rows in a table, you can throw that index on there and probably nobody will notice because it'll happen so quick, right? But if it's 200 billion rows, you got to be a lot more careful about that because it's going to lock up the table. It's going to take a, you know, a schema, an exclusive lock when it's building that index. And so you got to be a lot more careful with a big table. And what big means depends on your system. So that's why I did this because I want to be really careful. You know, if anybody ever notices what I'm doing as a DBA, I screwed up, right? You don't want them ever to notice what you're doing. And this helps you to not do that, hopefully. Hey, this is a big table. I got to be think about what I'm doing. All right, the next one is going to show missing index warnings in the plan cache. And a lot of times, this will come up with other ones that don't show up in the previous query. And this will take a long time to come back on a big instance. So be aware of that. But now this shows you the name of the store procedure. And it shows me it's a proc in this case and how many times it's been called. And if I clicked on this, it would show me the execution plan plus the missing index details for what it wants here. And that's really useful because now you know for sure what SP is generating this request. And that helps you decide if you want to give it that index or not. So it's very useful. But just remember, if you've got a, a really busy instance with lots and lots of plans in the cache, this might take half an hour to come back. I mean, it could take a long, excuse me, a long time. Usually it's a lot quicker than that, but here's another one that can take a long time to come back. This is, shows me what's using space in the buffer pool. So it shows me the schema and then the object name and then the index ID and how much space it's using in the buffer pool and then how many rows are in the table and then the compression type for row store indexes so it's going to show page or row or none. And what you should be on the lookout for is like log tables and auditing tables that are, you know, insert once and they just stay there and just get bigger and bigger. Those are good candidates for SQL Server data compression, which is in standard edition now, ever since SQL Server 2016. So not too many people in my experience use data compression and it can be very helpful. So here's another one looking for data compression candidates. This is showing you all your tables and how big they are and how much space they're taking and whether or not there's any compression on the clustered index or the heap. So that's another one I'm on the lookout for. And then we're going to look at table properties. And this is just going to show you some interesting stuff about all the tables in this database. So I show you the table name and how many rows are in it, and then all the indexes are here. So you can see how many indexes you have on each table, and then whether or not that index is compressed or not. Because remember, compression is at the index level. It's not at the database level or the table level. And then it shows you things like when the table was created and, and whether what's going on with bulk loads and whether it's in replication or not, and whether it's in CDC, whether it's a hecaton table or not. So some good stuff about your tables. All right. Now the next one is going to show me when were statistics last updated on all of my statistics and indexes. And this is, you know, if you've got auto update statistics disabled for some reason and your statistics are really stale, that can cause lots of issues. And this will help you spot that. So it shows you, you know, your tables and your views and it shows you the name of the object in question and whether or not it was auto-created or not and whether it's an incremental or a temporary. You know, temporary statistics are created on readable secondaries or just on secondaries in, in, in an AG, for example, and how many rows are in the table. So this just sort of helps you spot problems with your statistics being stale or inaccurate. All right, the next one is what I call volatile indexes. And this is indexes that are just seeing lots of updates. And why should you care about that? Why does that make any difference? Which indexes are seeing the most updates? Yeah, I mean, this is ones that are seeing the most activity. So you gotta be more careful about adding more indexes to it. That's one reason. Another reason you care is if you're thinking about, oh, maybe I should use data compression on this index, but it's really volatile then maybe you don't want to use data compression because 
anytime you update the value, you've got to decompress it and then change it and recompress it. So it adds overhead. That's why you want to try to use tables that are more static for compression. They're better candidates. So, you know, this is showing all this information about that and it's sorted by the modification counter and it's showing you how many rows are in the table and how many were sampled. So these are all really tiny tables, so it's sampling the entire row. All right, this, this one here is looking at your internal fragmentation on your indexes. And I know there's some controversy in the community and some people out there will tell you, well, if you've got flash storage, you don't need to worry about index fragmentation anymore. And at SQL Skills, we don't really believe that. We, we say it depends because index fragmentation can still cause problems for certain kinds of queries. And what I don't want you to do, you know, a lot of novice DBAs will go into the database maintenance wizard, which is evil, by the way, and they'll go in there and do silly things like, let's rebuild the index every night and then update statistics right after that, which is unnecessary, and they just generate a lot of activity and put a lot of load on their infrastructure for no good reason. And then some people, and I'm not gonna mention any names, but they'll say, oh, don't worry about it. Index fragmentation is obsolete. It's something to worry about. You know, it's more in the middle. But what you should do is do something like use Ola Hallengren and go in and set the parameters correctly so it looks to see how fragmented it is before it does anything. So try to find a happy middle. And running this query will help you figure out, because the reason I run this on customer systems is that when I come in here and I see that they're all 99% fragmented, that means they're not doing any index maintenance whatsoever, and we probably want to do something on them, you know, certain tables at least. So that's what this tells me, okay? All right, the next one in the set is going to show me which indexes have the most reads. And that's showing me which ones are most useful for select statements. And so, you know, that helps me kind of get a feel for my indexing strategy and also gives me a better feel for whether I want to use compression or maybe a column store index on that table because that's getting lots and lots of reads. So that's kind of useful to know. And it breaks it down to seeks and scans and lookups and then it shows you the total reads and total writes and what kind of an index and what your fill factor is and whether it's a filtered index or not. And then it shows you the last user scan and last user seek. So again, that's pretty useful if you're trying to understand your indexing strategy across all your different tables. And then the next one does the same thing for writes. So this is another place where you can possibly spot indexes that you can maybe drop. But this one is not filtered because the previous one is filtered to not show you any clustered indexes, and this shows you all the indexes. So you see a couple here that don't have any reads. So I'd want to keep my eye on that and maybe, you know, think, that, oh, yeah, maybe I can drop that later after I've been running for longer and I've seen my complete workload. And also, this also, you know, helps you figure out, oh, yeah, this, I'm seeing lots and lots of updates on this index, so I want to be more careful about using data compression. And I'll be more careful about adding more indexes to that same table. And also, that would tell me that maybe I want to use flash storage for the file group or the file where that thing lives. Or I want to use RAID 10 instead of RAID 5 because they're seeing lots of writes. So lots of information you get from that. All right, the next one is going to show me in-memory OLTP index usage. And I don't have any of that on this database. But if you are using that, how many people are using in-memory OLTP? Very few. Yeah, I mean, every time I ask that question, not too many people are using the feature. And then this will show us column store indexes and what's going on with them. And of course, Nico Niggebauer is the absolute world expert on column store indexes. I think he's giving a presentation tomorrow, I think, on column store. If you don't know about column store, you should go to that session. But anyways, I don't have any in this database. The next one is lock weights. So if you're seeing lots of blocking and, and deadlocking problems, if you run this one, this will tell you which indexes and which tables are seeing the most row lock weights and page lock weights. And this will 
Usually what that means in my case in practical terms is maybe you're missing an index and you're having to do a table scan or a clustered index scan that's putting locks on it and it's blocking other things. So if you get your indexing right, that'll help with this quite often. And if that doesn't fix it, the next thing you might want to do is RCSI, read committed snapshot isolation. You know, but you've got to be careful with that and do a lot of testing. So moving on, this is the UDF statistics for this database only. And there won't be any because I have this database set to 150. I mean, that doesn't mean there'll never be any, but most of them will get automatically inlined. And that feature seriously works pretty well in the testing that I've done so far. So that's a, a big reason you want to push to get on 2019 for that one feature alone if you have a lot of scalar UDFs in your databases. Of course, what I always try to do is don't even tell developers that scalar UDFs exist, and then maybe you'll get lucky and they won't figure it out on their own. <laughs> but anyways, so this is the one that we were talking about earlier that tells you whether or not your scalar UDFs are inlineable. And so, of course, since I don't have any that are not being inline, nothing shows up here. But if I go back to the results, it shows you the name of the UDF and if it is inlineable or not. And then it gives you a code for what kind of inlining it was going to do if it's inlineable. And like Jonathan said, Joe Sack has just updated the documentation to give more detail about that. And seriously, this is a really useful feature that you get with 2019. And then Query Store. How many people are using Query Store? Maybe a third. And that seems to be growing. But I'll, I'll tell you, Erin Salato is the Query Store queen, is what they call her now. But she really has done a lot of good work with Query Store. And what you need to be aware of with Query Store is if you're on SQL Server 2016, be more careful. And if you're on 2016, it's really important you're up to date with Service Pack 2 and the latest CU, because they've made a lot of really important query store fixes that they backported from 2017 to 2016. And 2017 generally works better, but the place you want to be really careful with query store is if you have a really highly ad hoc workload. If that's the case, query store can have problems sometimes. And you need to be careful about how big the storage size is set to and whether or not you're using all of it. And you know, the easy answer is to just make it bigger. But if you get bigger and bigger and bigger, once you get past a certain point, it becomes too big, and you're going to see big performance problems associated with it. And that's why I talked about that trace flag earlier. And it's more important with 2016 and 2017. They've made even more improvements in 2019 to Query Store. But anyways, after all that, you know, this is showing that Query Store is turned on. And it's in read-write, which is what you want, not read-only. And it's only using 32 megabytes of 500 here. But if you have lots of query activity, especially ad hoc query activity, you're going to see this fill up that 500 pretty quickly. And then you can easily grow it, like I said, but don't go above about 10 gigabytes, I believe, is kind of the threshold that I've heard and, and seen. So if it starts filling up 10 gigabytes, you might have to rethink whether Query Store is going to work for your database. No, the question is if you have optimized or ad hoc workloads enabled, will that affect this not going in there? No, it still goes in there, unfortunately. So yeah, that's ad hoc queries is the Achilles heel of Query Store. And it's gotten better in 2019. And it was better in 2017, but 2016 on early builds is where you had a lot of problems with that. Okay, well, almost done here, and I'm actually ahead of schedule, so <laughs> that surprises me. So the next one, how many people ever use uh, DBCC input buffer? You know, that's been around forever. And the problem with that is a lot of times you would see something like with SP2 who 2, and you'd go and grab the SPID and then go and try to put it in DBCC input buffer. And by the time you did it, it was gone, right? And you didn't see anything. And then the other problem is it would truncate how many characters came back, right? Well, this is a new DMV that they added, I believe, in 2016 that doesn't have that problem. 
And you can run it, you know, across the entire database and get all the SPIDs, and you don't have to manually input the SPID number. So it's a lot more useful than the old uh, DBCC input buffer. So it's pretty handy to run on a live system and see all the recent commands for every SPID, right? All right, the next thing is a, a new feature they added in 2017 and they enhanced it in 2019. So it's resumable index rebuild operations. Have you guys heard of this feature? Has anybody actually used it? Okay, well, this is something that was Enterprise edition only, obviously, since it relates to online index operations. But this lets you, if you're rebuilding an index in 2017, you can stop it and then restart it without losing all your progress and starting all over again. And in 2019, they enhanced it, so now you can do a create index and pause it and resume it. So that's pretty cool if you've got a great big table and you need to stop it. And also, it also protects you in 2019 if you fail over, instead of just everything being thrown away, it just picks up where it left off after you manually restart it again after a failover. So it's a pretty cool feature for really large tables. So this will show you if you have any of those in progress. Well, that's a good question. And, and luckily, I came to Pam's session right before this where she explained it in a lot of detail. But anyways, what happens, and it's similar. If you're doing an online index operation, well, what's happening is it's doing two writes. So it's updating the existing index while it's building the new one, right? So the same thing happens here. It's doing two writes and keeping two copies until the new one's complete. So if you pause it, it continues to do the double writes, but it just doesn't work on the index anymore. So all as the data is changing, it's writing to both. So you don't want to leave it pause forever because you're paying a performance price for it. But as soon as you unpause it, then it starts working on the index again as it continues to do the dual writes. So that's what happens. And you don't lose your progress on. No. No, that's the whole point. That's why you can do online index operations because the old one is still there while it's building the new one and then it switches them out and drops the old one. Yes? Yeah, the queries still use the old one until the new one's done. And just the same way as online index op operations have worked forever. Yes? Well, yeah, it's just a T-SQL command so you could write something to schedule it. Yeah, so you know, this could be useful if you only have a small window to work on it, and then you want to stop it and then start it again the next day during your little window. So yeah. So you just need to make sure you're just saying it's because you're MDF, you know, uh, MDF or NDF file is going to be Oh, yeah, because you're going to have two copies of the index for a while, so you need that extra space. Yeah, that's a good point. If you killed the process, will it roll back? I th Pam did a demo in her session where she actually shut down with no wait, which would be the equivalent of kill. And what happened when she brought it back up, it was just in a pause state. So it automatically, it doesn't roll back, it pauses. And you can also, there's another command called abort. So if you decide, okay, I've been working on this index for a while, but I decided to just stop it you can do abort and it'll just dump the new one. It's not the same as a transaction rollback. Well, yeah, I mean. This might help you. So again, he's talking about problems with availability groups and large indexes, and if you fail over in the middle, it takes forever to come up because and you've got the send queue and the redo queue, and depending on where all that is, because you can't come online until the redo that's been sent gets replayed, right? And that could take a long time. So this might help you control that. Yes, Erlen. Yeah. And the little small ones, yeah. Yep. 
All right, the next one is automatic tuning options. And this is another new feature they added in 2017, Enterprise Edition only, so make sure you keep that in mind. And you only have one thing you can do, and it's called force last good plan. And this requires query store being running on the database. So if you have query store running and you turn this on, what this basically does is automate plan forcing. So how many people have used query store and forced a plan, right? Well, you've got to manually do that. This automatically does it for you. And what it's looking for is regressions based on the CPU time of the query. So if it notices that a query suddenly start using a lot more CPU than it used to, it'll automatically go back to that last known plan. And then it watches it for a while to make sure that it didn't make it much worse. And if it did, it'll undo that and go back to the plan it was using. So that's all it does. And they did not add anything else in 2019 on top of that. And if you're using Azure SQL Database, they have a couple other options here. One's for index creates and one's for index drops, I believe. So you can automate that in Azure SQL Database. So that'll probably show up in on-premises SQL Server sooner or later. So that's what that means. And again, this is enterprise edition only and it has to have query store running or else it won't work. All right, finally, after all this, we're at the last one in the set. And this will show you your most recent full database backups for this database. And it tells you your recovery model and how big it is and what it, the compression went down to and your compression ratio. So I'm getting pretty good compression on this database. And also backup checksums, I think those should always be turned on. It, and what that does, if you have backup checksums turned on, then as the backup's running, it's calculating a checksum, and if the checksum fails, the backup will error out. And that's what you want, because you don't want that false sense of security that your backup is good when it really isn't. Now, this doesn't prove that it's good. It just gives more of a likelihood that it's good. How can you really tell if a backup is good? What's the only way? Restore, restore it. So if you don't restore it, you don't really know, but at least it gives you a little bit more insurance because that's the fastest way to update your resume, right? Is to lose your database and not have a good backup. And I can't tell you, you know, hopefully you guys know Paul Randall, my boss, he wrote DBCC CheckDB when he worked at Microsoft. And so because of that, seriously, we get an email about once or twice a week from some poor frantic DBA. And they'll say something like, oh, my database is in suspect mode. And so I run DBCC check DB and it comes back with these errors. What should I do? And Paul will look at it and sometimes he'll say, nothing. There's nothing you can do. Restore from your last good backup. And sometimes he'll say, well, if you do this or this and this, it might work, but you still might have to restore from your last good backup. And then sometimes, you know, he sends that email out and then like an hour later we get another email, oh my God, my backup wouldn't restore. What do I do? <laughs> and, and seriously, that happens, and we've seen companies go out of business. Because think about it, your database is gone, your backups are gone, it's game over. So please don't let that happen to you. Do things like have backup checksums on and restore your backups on a regular basis so that never ever happens to you. I don't want to see you send an email to Paul because he can't help you. So. All right, and then one last thing I want to point out about this query, I almost forgot. See where it shows the backup location where it went to and also the physical block size? This can be really useful because how many people have to deal with like people, if you're in virtualization, people using Veeam to back up the VM? And then sometimes Veeam will go in and back up SQL Server without you knowing about it. Has that ever happened to you? It's bitten me a bunch of times. So let's say you're doing something like log shipping and you got log shipping going perfectly and you go in and look at it and your log shipping is busted. And it turns out that Veeam went in there and did some transaction log backups that you didn't know about and you're missing those. So then log shipping is busted. So one way to spot that is if you come in here to the backup location and instead of seeing something like this or a UNC file path, you see a GUID. That tells you that something weird outside of SQL Server is doing the backups, and you don't want that. 
And as a DBA, I'm going to fight that as much as I can. I want to do my own backups. And if you want to use some appliance or whatever fancy thing you want, after I'm done with the backups, go ahead. But I want my own backups local that I can get to just for a few. So I don't have to involve anybody else to get those backups out of some appliance. So my point here is this helps you spot that that's going on if you see a GUID here instead of a file path. That's true, a copy only won't cause a problem, but it still would for a transaction log, you know. So anyways, the rest of this is just links to my uh, Pluralsight courses that go into this stuff in more detail. I've got six of them on these DMV queries. So if you haven't watched those, that might be helpful to you. So are there any other questions? Because I'm really pretty much on time here, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I had one query that I ran through, but I don't have an AG here, so it came blank. And I actually have a whole bunch of other AG queries, but I just don't have them in this general purpose set. But yeah, there is one in the set that'll show you kind of a high level view of how your AG is doing health-wise. Okay, the question is why do I have no lock and recompile on all the queries? That's because I don't want to ever cause any locking with my query is for why no lock is there. And then the other recompile, I don't want my query to go into the plan cache. You know, it's probably not a big deal, but I don't want to cause any problems on your server that you're running these queries on. Yeah. Any other questions back there? Yeah, the question is, is there any query or anything that in my stuff that'll let you figure out why a backup is running slow? Is it an I.O. problem or a network problem or whatever? There's nothing really in here directly. What I would do would be looking at Perfmon and maybe Resource Monitor and try to figure out, you know, is it a problem reading from the data file or is it a problem writing to the backup file? You know, that sort of thing. And you can also run some benchmarks to figure out, you know, what, what can your file where the data file lives, what can it do, the storage, and what can the, where it's going to in terms of write. So there's lots of ways to look at that, but none of these queries by themselves really give you that answer. I do an I.O. presentation where I do some demos that help you get to the bottom of that. So yeah, I just don't have it in this set. Or over there. Do you, do you run your queries in PowerShell? Very seldom. <laughs> Yeah, because, and the reason, and the question is, do I run these with PowerShell? Do I use the I.O. tools, you know, DBIO? No, because I like to run them manually, and then I'm pasting them to a spreadsheet, and I'm marking up the spreadsheet with, with color codes. And then I usually am taking notes, because we do health checks at SQL Skills a lot, and so we, we get these back, and then I'm writing up all this stuff to write a report. And so it helps me think through what's going on, but. You know, there's no reason why I couldn't automate it and look at the results. I'm just kind of in the habit of doing it, you know, because I'm building the picture as I'm going through it manually. It seems to be work better. But because if I had hundreds of servers, that wouldn't work. You know, I usually have the luxury of just one server. How can you get the copy of the queries? Okay, the question, which I've heard like five times today, which is a good question. How do you get these queries? Google Glenberry DMV, and it should take you to a page that has all these queries, and I update them every month. And if you can't find it that way, go to the SQL Skills blog and go to my blog, and then just scroll through, because I update them every month, and you should find it, because I only write five or six blog posts a month, usually, or, or less, so. Yeah.
Yeah, well the question is do I have something that separates out what the system is doing versus what the user is doing from a CPU perspective? The answer is no. If, you know, send me an email and maybe I can figure out a way to do that and add that. And seriously, I'm always looking for suggestions on what is some problem you have that my queries won't help you figure out. And if you have, you know, suggestions like that, send them to me and I, maybe I can figure out a way to do it, you know? So that's actually helpful. Yeah, I don't know. I know that when you run DBCC check DB, it has to do a snapshot to, to run it against, and maybe it's related to that. But yeah, I don't know. That'd be a question for Paul. You know, send him an email, and because that's still his baby, even though he left Microsoft forever ago. So he might respond if you send him an email with a specific question about it. So any other questions? All right. Okay, one more. So was that about column store indexes or a, a compressed index? I didn't quite get all that. Oh, okay. Well, I think the question is uh, fill factor. Fill factor can be useful because it leaves more space inside the index and index fragmentation doesn't go up as quickly, but the downside is it makes your index bigger. So it depends. I mean, if you want to minimize your index maintenance burden, Lowering the fill factor a little bit can be helpful there, but then again, that's gonna make your indexes take up more space and your database bigger, so it depends on, on the workload. Persistent calls, page four, which is really Yeah, so <clears throat> anyways, thank you for staying late today, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.